My name is Bitbane. Uh, I also go by Tim occasionally. Uh, I am a largely a recovered uh, software engineer. Uh, somewhere on the line, I became a hardware guy. I'm not quite sure exactly when Bit started making more sense to me than code, but it happened along the way. Um, and I have a background doing safety critical aerospace and automotive, and I still get kind of twitchy around a large composite body aircraft. I'm N2. Uh, in meat space, most people call me Mitch. I'll go by either. Um, I have a really kind of weirdly broad background in software development. I've worked on everything from like complicated modern web apps all the way to firmware for pipeline inspection robots. Um, some time ago, I realized I like breaking stuff better. Uh, and now I work at Grimm as a security researcher. Uh, Grimm is a uh, cybersecurity research development and consulting company. Uh, awesome company to work for. I'm not just saying that because our CEO and chairman of the board are in the front row. Um, headquartered right here in Arlington, Virginia. And uh, I come visit our booth and hack our, our toaster. Our toaster desperately needs hacking. All right, so today we're going to be talking about CAN, uh, quite a bit lower details than most talks you might have seen um, that just kind of gloss over all the electrical stuff that's going on. Um, and we'll also be talking about a tool we wrote called CANT, um, which exercises some uh, niche features of the protocol. So CAN bus is uh, the control area network. It was developed by Bosch back all the way back in 1983. Um, they started releasing controllers in 1986, and they amended the spec to version 2.0 in 1991. It's designed for um, reliable communications between cheap and uh, cheap, primarily. Uh, microcontrollers. Um, it's used commonly in uh, cars, which we'll talk more about, as well as like all kinds of different industrial applications. Um, you'll find it in the medical field, in aerospace. Uh, what are what other industries am I failing the list here? Uh, building automation. A lot of elevators run CAN bus, is my understanding. Hilton, I'm sorry if anything happens. Uh, it first found its way into a car in 1991 in a Mercedes-Benz W140. Um, you'll find a lot of references to a BMW that ran CAN in 1987, but as far as I can tell, it was actually just serial. I don't know. That's weird. Whatever. <laughs> All right, so why CAN bus? Well, primarily it's cheap, um, and it's cheap in a lot of different ways. Uh, the the, my, the Silicon to make it doesn't take a whole. It's a fairly simple protocol. It doesn't take a whole lot of. I'll uh, take up a whole lot of silicon space on a chip to put a CAN peripheral on there. Uh, the transceiver is also a pretty simple piece of piece of hardware that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, one of the primary cost savings, though, is that it was able to allow it, it allowed the auto manufacturers to save a ton of money on their wiring harnesses. Um, I saw references to companies saving uh, two kilometers of wire and 46 kilograms off of their wiring harness when they switched to CAN bus um, from doing everything, but they just had lines running everywhere, essentially GPIOing everything. Um, so it, that saved the auto manufacturers a ton of money uh, switching to CAN bus. And at the time, 91, nobody really thought about security, uh, especially in cars, because who would ever stick a car on the internet? That's just dumb. It's also reliable. Uh, it was designed, and we'll go over some of the design features that it has, but it was designed to be really reliable to transient errors, you know, electrical errors of the car. It's an no electrically noisy environment. I mean, when your starter is drawing 200 amps of power, it tends to, to cause some power fluctuations um, that can be picked up. CAN's really robust to that sort of thing. Not so much robust to a well, less of a controlled attack scenario. Um, it's also mandated by law. It turns out if you tell the, auto, the automakers that they cannot sell their vehicle if they don't do something, it's a good way to get them to do it. So CAN bus is mandated by law. Um, this law that I have referenced up here, it mandates ISO 15765-4, uh, Road Vehicle Diagnostics on Controller Area Network Part 4, Requirements for Emission-Related Systems. This is also all related to the OBD2 connector. 
So uh, this law was passed in 2008. In 1996, the California Air Resource Board uh, mandated the OBD, OBD2 port so they could do their emissions test from one place. Between 1996 and 2008, there were essentially five protocols used by the OBD2 standard. CAN was one of them. Uh, you also had uh, KWP2000 slash ISO14230, uh, K-Line slash ISO9141, and two different versions of uh, SAE J1850. Um, between 96 and 2008, uh, your car would have used one of these, but then you had to have, of course, dongles that could speak all those protocols in order to do your emissions testing. 2008, they decided that that was getting too complicated and they were going to mandate um, just CAN for the use on OBD2 for emissions related stuff. And because CAN was mandated there for emission stuff, a lot of the auto manufacturers started using CAN for in other places as well since they were already using it and had to use it there. So how does the CAN bus work? Uh, it depends. So CAN bus actually has, it, it has no physical layer description in the pr uh, main protocol documents. Those are provided by um, separate interface specs. So all the CAN bus uh, protocol really cares about is you have a dominant and a recessive signaling level. So you end up with uh, a couple different implementations that are fairly widespread. GM has a version which operates on one wire. Today we're focused on um, ISO 11898-2, which is a high-speed CAN bus um, using two wires and differential signaling. So on this slide, we've got a uh, graph of voltage versus time for a CAN message. So you have two lines. You've got one for CAN high and you've got one for CAN low. In the recessive state, the idle state on the bus, both of those lines will be floating around two and a half volts. When a uh, transmitter on the bus wants to send a dominant bit, it pulls the CAN high line to 3.3 volts and the ish. ish, somewhere in there. It's, it's usually not too picky. And the CAN low uh, line to about one volt. So you actually get like a, a significant swing in your voltage like levels. Um, to send a one again, because electrical engineers are crazy and they like having bits backwards, um, you release control of the bus and it floats back to two and a half volts. And <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting over a bit of a cold. Um, so the, you have the, this uh, on the, the differential signal inside here. Uh, this feeds into what's called a CAN transceiver. And a CAN transceiver, uh, a lot of people have a, a misconception about CAN transceivers that they actually uh, have something to do with CAN following the CAN protocol spec. But all they really are is just a, a logic shifter. Um, you can see it's pretty simple electronically. Uh, it takes this differential signaling input where you have you know, both lines at two and a half volts for a one and the lines pulled apart to about one, one and a half, three and a half volts uh, for a zero, and takes that and translates it back into your processor logic level output here. Um, and here, the bits actually make sense. A one is a one, and a zero is a zero, as God intended it to be. And then vice versa. So when the transceiver, when your uh, microcontroller sends a, tries to transmit, it'll transmit a one, your uh, your CAN transceiver will translate that into the recessive state, will basically let go of the bus and let it do what it wants to do, um, transmit a zero, and it will then transmit a zero on the bus. Uh, so the, the one key feature of the CAN bus, the, 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 basically the one thing the CAN spec does say that your physical layer has to support is if any node on the bus is transmitting a zero, is trying to assert the dominant state, the state of the bus will be in the dominant state. In order for the state of the bus to be in the recessive state, all of the nodes on the bus must be transmitting a recessive. And this is, uh, we'll show why that's important in a couple of slides. So this is what a CAN bus frame looks like on the network. Um, out front in green, you've got your ID bits. So these are used for something called um, the arbitration phase. So in CAN bus, uh, to enable some of its high reliability goals. Uh, if two, two transmitters start 
sending at the same time. Whoever has the message ID with the most or the lowest ID will actually get control of the bus through a process called arbitration. So this ID out front, um, as Tim mentioned on the last slide, whoever is sending a zero will actually get the CAN bus into a state of a zero. So I'm not explaining this well today. Um, in this, in the case of this message, uh, if a, um, in the like fourth bit where you first see the first dips, if another message had, was transmitting a zero there, or another node was transmitting a zero there, this node would um, have to let go of the bus and you would, uh, it would get that slot. Uh, after the ID, you get a, um, uh, a few more interesting bits. You've got a, uh, a remote request bit in blue, um, some extension bits, which were used in the 1991 2.0 spec to enable 29-bit identifiers. If you uh, use a 29-bit identifier, the ID bits get inserted um, right before the yellow phase. You have four bits for how many data bytes are in the message. And then immediately after that, you just start inserting your data bits uh, in red. At the end, you've got a 15-bit CRC with a weird polynomial. I don't think anything else uses that CRC. And then at the very end, you've got some fairly interesting bits in the form of a uh, ACK slot and an ACK bit. So to enable like reliable reception, uh, where as a transmitter you can actually tell that someone heard you and you aren't just shouting into a void, uh, the last zero bit you see um, is actually a place in the message for another node, if it heard you, to assert a one on the bus. So whatever nodes heard a message, and hopefully all of them do, uh, will say, hey, I got a message, and draw that, uh, pull that bit down. At the end, you've got some uh, spacing uh, to be able to distinguish between messages on the bus in a uh, end of frame and a separate, technically, interframe space. And we'll talk a little bit more later about how CANT can be used to do interesting stuff to pretty much every single one of these fields. Uh, so what Mitch was talking about earlier about this is just another illustration of how CAN does arbitration. Um, so here we have two nodes, no, node A and node B, that start transmitting on the bus at the same time. Now, they're not going to be able to tell that both two buses are transmitting because they uh, both start by transmitting zeros. So they're both asserting a dominant bit on the bus. Um, the start bit is a zero, and they both transmit a couple of zeros. Now, what happens here in bit seven, node a transmits a zero, but node B transmits a one. But because what I mentioned earlier, the, the, like the one defining characteristic of, can, of the CAN bus physical layer is that if any node is asserting a zero, then all of the nodes will read a zero. Node A will start asserting a zero. Node B uh, sends a one, but node B will see then that the state of the bus is a zero. So at this point, node B knows that, some, that node A, or another node, is continuing to transmit. So node B at this point taps out, node A continues on its merry way and sends its message. And then this point, uh, once node A is done, node B will then try to send again. So this is how uh, CAN does its arbitration, does its bus access. Uh, so CAN was designed to be resilient to temporary errors. So if you have a sh uh, temporary like bus short or a really huge burst of noise that overcomes your differential signaling. Um, the specification allows for some um, error counting and error uh, recovery mechanisms. Uh, there's several different types of errors it's designed to detect and recover from within the spec. You have bit errors, um, which you only detect if you're a transmitter. Um, a bit error occurs when you uh, transmit a bit in your data field, in your data, that doesn't appear on the bus. So if someone's actually walking over your, your transmission, 
uh, you will get a bit error from your CAN controller. Uh, you can have stuff errors, which will happen if um, uh, you violate something called bit stuffing rules. On the CAN bus to uh, prevent like the bus from hanging in a bad state or from uh, to keep uh, receipt. Synchronization. That's the word I'm looking for. To keep synchronization between nodes on the bus, you can only have five bits of the same polarity in a row. So you like want to keep different clock edges. Uh, so if you want to send six zeros, you need to insert a one after the fifth zero, uh, and then you can keep going. A stuff, a stuff error is raised if you don't um, insert that stuff bit. There are CRC errors, the, where if the data integrity is like broken, you'll get a CRC error. Form errors, if you don't uh, see messages that look the right way. So if your um, uh, ACK bits are not right, I've never actually seen these in the field. They're, they're weird. Yeah, there's, there's a couple fields that are fixed form. They have a, a specific format, and they don't actually get bit stuffed. And one of them is the, uh, at the end, the, the 101 in the, the CRC delimiter, ACK delimiter. There's a couple other fixed form fields as well. But if one of those fixed form fields doesn't actually adhere to the correct form, it overrides a form error. Uh, and then last, there's an ACK error. If you don't have another node set the ACK bit in your message, uh, you, you get an uh, acknowledgment error. Um, all of these different errors uh, have an interaction with two error counters that we'll talk about later. Uh, so we talked about the data frame earlier. I'm going to touch a little bit on a couple other frames. Uh, there is a CAN remote frame. Um, basically, what a CAN, re however a CAN remote frame is is if a uh, if a node on the bus wants the uh, somebody else on the bus to send a piece of data with a specific arbitration ID, it will send a remote frame. Uh, the re remote frame has that remote transmission request bit set, and then it sends a remote frame with that arbitration ID that it wants to be sent. So. It'll send that remote transmission request, and hopefully the bus on the other end uh, will, be, will then send the data uh, that the node is requesting. That's not particularly interesting for what we're doing here. I am going to talk also about error frames and overload frames. So there's two different types of error frames. And this is, so CAN has a, a, a way of essentially gracefully kicking nodes off of the CAN bus if they're misbehaving, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But the active error and the passive error Error, hand, uh, error frames are part of that process of a node getting kicked off the CAN bus uh, if it's continuing to misbehave. So in an active error state, when a node detects any of these five errors, um, initially it'll send an active error. Basically it'll send six dominant bits, which you'll notice violates bit stuffing. Uh, it sends more than five bits in a row, so this will send the six bits. Um, all of the other nodes on the bus, because these are dominant and the state of the bus is gonna be dominant for this entire time, all of the other nodes on the bus are going to detect some sort of an error, be it a form error or a, uh, a bit stuffing error, um, depending on exactly when this error frame happens. But, and then, so all the bus will error out. That message is essentially canceled. And after the uh, error delimiter, which is eight recessive bits, um, they'll start trying to synchronize, sync up, and continue on. Now, once a, no once a node has gotten to a certain error state, um, which again we'll get to with the error counters, it switches into what's called a passive error state. And with a passive error state, um, it sends this passive error frame, which is six recessive bits. And so these recessive bits don't actually change the state of the CAN bus. If another node is sending a dominant bit, it will continue to send the dominant bit. But the node that's sending these passive error messages is checking to see whether or not it's actually seeing six recessive bits on the bus and is using that then to modify its error counters. Uh, also overload frames. This is a, a, a basically after a message is successfully received, uh, any node on the bus can send what's called an overload frame. This is basically a hold on a second, I'm processing, but give, give me a second to catch back up and get back on the bus. Um, so it's entering the intermission, which is the three recessive bits at the very end of the CAN frame. Um, it looks like an error frame. It's six uh, dominant bits and eight recessive bits, uh, but because of where it's sent, 
the CAN nodes are able to distinguish that this is an overload frame, not an error frame. And they'll all just wait for the overload frame to finish being sent uh, before they start tra transmitting again to give that node a chance to catch up. I do uh, like in the CAN spec. Uh, the CAN spec says at most two overload frames may be generated. It doesn't say what to do if there's more than two overload frames, though. I, this was interesting to me. Um, all right, so can error counter, so uh, can's fault confinement um, is what I was alluding to earlier with the, how it gracefully kind of tries to kick a can node off the bus if it starts misbehaving. Uh, there's two error counters, a transmit error counter and a receive error counter. Um, and the three error states, active error, passive error, and bus off. And here's a state diagram of how those counters work. Um, so when, uh, no, when a node is in the error active state, that's where it will send the active error. We'll actively try to clobber the bus if it sees an error um, so the message isn't received properly and everybody will try to resync and try again. Um, these error counters, though, get incremented. Uh, there's a lot of edge cases and how the error counters get incremented. Um, I'm going to gloss over those edge cases a bit, though, and just say that pretty much if you, there's a transmit error, if a node is transmitting and sees an error, it will increment its error counter by eight. Um, a receive error will increment its error counter by one. Uh, and then if, for every time a transmitter transmits a message uh, without any errors, it will decrement the error counter by one. And when a receiver receives an error, an error uh, receives a frame without any errors, then it will decrement its error counter uh, by one. So if the error counter is less than 128, they are in the active errors, error state, and they will go ahead and actively try to clobber uh, any frame that has an error. Once those error counters get above 128, then they'll transmit, uh, switch into the uh, error passive state, where they send that passive error fl uh, flag that doesn't actually have any impact on the CAN bus. Um, it's just used by whichever node is in that, that error state to basically see if it's able to um, actually send this error message. Uh, you see what the state the bus is in. Uh, once those error counts get above 256, you go into the bus off state. And in bus off, you can't have any interaction on the CAN bus um, whatsoever. can't do anything actively on the CAN bus at all. Um, you can get out of the bus off and get back into your error active state either after a reset or uh, if you see 128 uh, occurrences of 11 consecutive recessive bits. So the, essentially the bus is idle for an extended period of time then you can try to get back on and try again. So Can's, Can's sort of basic philosophy um, is in the nature of the Mac sublayer that there is no freedom for modification. This is a quote from section one of the Can spec. It assumes from the, the very beginning that everything on the Can bus is going to behave uh, the way that it ought to. And uh, I've been wishing for, for quite a while for a tool that I could use to actually test some of these assumptions. One of the things that I really love hearing um, as a security researcher is people saying that can't happen. Um, as a good hardware hacker, I understand that the, the sole purpose of the electron is for me to bend it to my will and have it do what I wish for it to do. Um, having a tool that allows me to do that uh, gives you a lot of power over a lot of the assumptions that are made in a system. Um, one of the problems with a lot of the existing CAN-based research tools is that they're, based, they're built using a standard CAN peripheral that uh, follows these rules essentially, it limits the amount that you're able to do on the CAN bus. You can't violate some of these like the uh, overload frames or you know, not, not stopping transmitting if you lose the arbitration. Um, gives you a lot more flexibility in targeting specific ECUs. Um, inspired by a lot of conversations I've had with other people in the car hacking community, uh, a lot of uh, need, something I've wanted myself uh, for, uh, on some research projects we've done. Uh, but finally kicked me in the butt, though, to get, actually get it done is this ICS Alert 17-209-01 that was published uh, July or August of uh, last year. Uh, talking about some of this stuff, I wanted to take what they did uh, expand on it and create a tool that would give you the ability to uh, basically screw around with the CAN bus electrically and see what you could do with that. So that's why we built CANT. Uh, CANT is purpose-built to abuse the CAN spec. Um, 
through several of the attacks we've uh, built, you can target individual ECUs uh, and individual messages. Uh, we based it around a ST microcontroller, uh, microelectronics, Nucleo H7 board. Um, it's, it runs at like 400 megahertz, which if you've ever done embedded stuff, that's mind blowing. Um, you can't even buy these like yet. No one's stocking them enough because the demand is like high and it's very new silicon, but it's uh, wonderful to work with. Um, so the current attacks we've built with this, um, uh, one is like a traditional CAN bus like hello world attack where you just de uh, denial of service all messages. Um, lots of the time uh, people do this just by sending a bunch of messages with all zeros in the like message ID field. Uh, this is significantly more effective uh, when implemented with can't because you don't increase bus load artificially. Um, because you're only responding to other messages that are uh, attempting to be, be sent. Um, and you never uh, like have a space where your microcontroller is lagging or your uh, host PC isn't sending messages fast enough. Uh, we also have an attack where we can replace data, uh, the data frame of a message with whatever we want uh, due to the CAN recessive uh, rules or just how it works, you might not get all your data bits uh, sent um, until you knock the other node off the bus, which um, it will eventually happen based on the bus off like error state. And we can inject overload frames, um, which has some interesting effects on bus load and uh, availability. So CAN advantages, um, like I mentioned, you have, you have complete control over all the signal on the CAN bus. Uh, currently, with the exception that you can't force a recessive, another node is a certain a dominant, you can't currently force a recessive. I have some ideas about that, um, but I haven't had a chance to actually test them yet. Um, CAN is set up so that uh, initially when you plug it in, it follows along with the CAN, the CAN spec, just exactly as behaving exactly as it ought to. Um, but then as soon as, of course, you want to start misbehaving on the CAN bus, um, yeah, you basically you tell CAN that it can't. So you sort of just can do whatever it is, uh, whatever you want um, at that point. Uh, if an ECU is giving you trouble, you can just uh, try to force it into the bus off state, essentially. Um, one of the, the common themes that you run into with uh, hacking cars on the, with the CAN bus is that you'll try to do something but another ECU on the bus is, a, like, so you're sending, like it says, hey, an error message. The other ECU on the bus, though, is sending the correct state of the vehicle, that there isn't an error message. Um, and this, uh, yeah, and so this allows you to knock that ECU off the CAN bus to stop sending that message so that you can then send the message that you want to be sent without being overridden uh, by the ECU that should be sending that message. This is also can be difficult to detect. So one of the things that automakers have been doing uh, recently is putting like IDS, IPS type systems on the CAN bus to identify anomalous behavior. And so one of the ways to get around, that sometimes works to get around this limitation of uh, trying to override a, another ECU is just by flooding the bus with a message. So you just send the message at 10 times the rate that the other ECU is sending the message out at and it will do what you want. This is really obvious to an IDS though, and an IDS or IPS is going to see this, is going to flag this as being anomalous. With CANT though, I can just clobber this message using the CAN, normal CAN signaling. Um, the IDS, IPS, especially if it's built on a traditional CAN peripheral, probably isn't even gonna be able to see this. Uh, and then I can just go ahead and take over for that ECU. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some mitigations for CANT, things you could do to uh, prevent it from happening a little bit later. Um, but it's another advantage of CANT that you can get around some of the IDS, IPS systems in vehicles uh, with this method. So there's uh, essentially, there's, there's three different types of attacks against vehicles. Um, isn't like a, 
you know, a completely thought out taxonomy, but basically you can attack the safety of a vehicle, try to make it uh, less safe to operate it, try to take control over it. Um, you could set up uh, ransomware on the vehicle. You know, you can't go more than 25 miles an hour. That's giving me three Bitcoin, which is gonna be like eight bucks in a few months, but. <laughs> <laughs> or of course theft, uh, they go on up on YouTube. There's a bunch of videos about, uh, from security cameras of people stealing cars using some, uh, using some of these uh, higher tech tools, you know, the CAN bus, unlock the vehicle, start the vehicle, drive the vehicle away, and uh, yeah, because sometimes the automatic manufacturers leave their CAN bus accessible from the outside of the vehicle, um, which is probably not something they should do. All right, let me have a uh, video demonstration. going to recognize 3PO, our mobile car hacking demo. It's been at quite a few conferences, including at ShmooCon last year. Uh, we have hooked up to 3PO. Uh, we have our CanCat device, which is your standard uh, can hacking device, usually a can peripheral, and which forces it to behave appropriately. And we have our uh, STM32H7 uh, dev board uh, hooked up to a uh, CAN transceiver uh, that allows us to misbehave on the CAN bus. So we're going to start out by showing the bus killer attack. So the bus killer attack is the one where whenever any of the nodes on the network starts trying to transmit, uh, we'll go ahead and transmit uh, an arbitration ID of zero, uh, preventing any node from transmitting on the bus. Go ahead and get that set up. And we'll see that the bus ends up dying. If we take a look at the oscilloscope over here, um, we can see that it's constantly sending out these uh, short messages um, caused by me. If I hit the reset button, it goes back to normal behavior. And we see that the car uh, comes back. One of the, the primary reasons that I uh, we decided to develop uh, Cant is uh, uh, an issue you run into quite frequently when car hacking is that a node on the network will constantly send out a piece of information that is overriding what you're trying to do. I'll go ahead and demonstrate that with the CanCat. Um, so on the CanCat, I'm going to send a message that will cause the brake fluid low light to come on here on the instrument cluster. See, so it comes on, it beeps, but it immediately goes away. And the reason for that is because the body control module is constantly sending out uh, a message about three times a second that the brake fluid level is actually fine. So I can override it for a short period of time, but it goes away very quickly. What the CamCat allows us to do is it allows us to selectively target this message, and I have an attack written for it that allows us to uh, replace the data in a message with the data of my choosing. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that set up. And we'll see that the brake fluid light now comes on um, and stays on. If you take a look at the CAN bus, we'll see, if I adjust this a little bit, um, we'll see. So what's happening here is this is where the body control module is trying to come back online. These larger spikes here are the error frames that the body control module is sending. Um, because I'm overriding this data. I'm writing a zero to the bus when it's expecting a one, which is causing it to send the error frame. And then once it sends 16 of these error frames, which if you count, there's 16 of them there. Um, when it sends those 16 error frames, it goes to bus off, it goes to error passive, and then eventually to bus off mode, and allows me to keep sending my uh, malicious message without being overwritten by the body control module. <laughs> Uh, the third attack that we have working for CAMP right now is uh, the uh, overload frame attack. So with the overload, the overload frames that send at the end of a frame to request 
a uh, little bit more time for the node to catch up before it processes the next scan message, essentially. Now, the specification says that it can send up to two overload frames, but the specification doesn't say what you're supposed to do if you see more than two overload frames. So I was curious what happens if we send more than two overload frames. I'm going to start with sending. I'm going to start with sending just sending two like we're like we're supposed to. And if we look over here um, at the oscilloscope, again we can see these are our two overload frames that we're sending after each message here and here. And everything seems to be behaving as per usual, as, as it should. Let's go ahead and try sending more. Let's try sending Try sending three of these frames. Well, I think it still seems to be working. And if I take a look, yeah, sure enough, we have three of these overload frames being sent on the oscilloscope. Let's try more than that. Let's try 10. Let's see what 10 does. Well, it still seems to be working. If you come over here, Look at how it's going. We have now 10 spikes on the, on the scope. That seems to be working just fine. Let's try more, let's try 42. And at 42, we now see that we are actually causing the bus to die. Uh, the brake fluid low came on for some reason. Um, it's, everything's kind of starting to dim. It's just behaving abnormally. And we come back here to the oscilloscope, we see now that we are sending a whole bunch of those overload frames. And as soon as I hit the reset button, we see that our bus comes back as usual. And there's a demo. All right, so that's Kent. Um, it does have some limitations. Uh, one of the limitations being that currently it would require physical access to the vehicle. Um, physical access isn't always as hard to obtain as one might think. Um, as I mentioned, some auto ma manufacturers are nice enough to leave the CAN bus uh, exposed on the outside of the vehicle. Um, also, ride sharing, uh, mechanics, valets, uh, people, a lot of people have physical access to your vehicle. I just have some thoughts on how to not have to have physical access on this. Um, yeah. Um, one of the ways that you could detect something like can't being plugged into your, your vehicle um, is that it will increase the, can, the, the electrical load on the CAN bus. Um, there's some efforts that use like power fingerprinting to see if anything's misbehaving on the CAN bus. Um, obviously, can't would stick out like a sore thumb uh, if you're doing any, power, any sort of power fingerprinting on the CAN bus. Um, although, one of the downsides of doing this, of course, is that you know if you plug an insurance dongle into your OBD2 port or you take your car to the shop and they plug their diagnostic tool into the OBD2 port, um, that's also going to change the bus load. But you want to be able to allow that to happen. Well, maybe not the insurance dongles if you don't need the research on them. Um, but at least the, the mechanics tool, you know, you do want the, your you know your car to be fixed occasionally. Um, so the power fingerprinting has a would have to be have some way to be disabled possibly uh, in order for those tools to work. Um, network segmentation, uh, you have to be physically on the same bus. Uh, auto manufacturers are starting to uh, segment their networks so they'll have their, you know, their emissions related stuff on one network. They'll have a separate network for infotainment, separate network for like lower speed stuff. Um, and you have to be, of course be on this, physically on the same network as whatever it is you're trying to attack. So that's uh, a way to limit what you can do with CANT. Uh, encryption may be the, one of the big problems with encryption with CAN is that you only have that eight byte message length. Um, so that makes, kind of can make encryption really hard to do. Uh, you're also usually talking about really small, low powered processors, like eight 16 bit micros in many cases, um, that you can't do the overhead. And some of the stuff is also uh, time critical, safety critical stuff, and encryption has overhead there. So there's some bones with that. Um, 
one of the uh, more obvious solutions to me is to use something besides CAN, uh, FlexRay, Automotive Ethernet. There's other options out there. Um, unfortunately, CAN is, as I mentioned before, mandated by law. All right, um, the CAN spec is freely available. Um, I also put a link up here to the uh, paper that led to the CVE. Um, it has some interesting stuff in it. And then um, we're releasing CAN as open source software. I'm actually gonna go ahead and push it uh, right now, hopefully. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. There it is. All right, so Cant is now available up on GitHub. Um, as we mentioned, the dev board is uh, really difficult to get a hold of right now. Your best bet is Mouser, and they'll get it to you like mid-March or so if you want to play with it. Um, but yeah, the code's up there. Any questions? Uh, yeah, at 50 it died. <laughs> I just didn't want to put that much in the demo. Sorry, I'm having a difficult time. Oh, um, so for the brake fluid message, um, so, so the, the question is uh, how long did it take me to figure out basically what controller was sending the message? So for the brake fluid one, it's pretty easy. Um, we found a, so our, our uh, demo that we had is out of a Ford Focus. We were able to find a wiring diagram for that pretty easily. Um, and like the, the brake fluid is just a float switch. So the brake, the brake fluid float switch physically connects back to the body control module. Um, I guess I made the assumption that since it was physically connected to the body control module, the body control module was the one that was sending the message, but that's not much of an assumption. What controller is on the CAN bus that you wouldn't immediately assume to be taxed by this? I'm not sure I understand the control. Right, we know that uh, the PTM is sending information about fluid levels, things like that. Okay. Uh, so the question is if there's uh, nodes on the CAN bus that wouldn't necessarily be affected by these attacks. So then this is an attack against like the, the base CAN protocol. Um, so uh, everything that's compliant should, so and there's different ways to, res to respond, I guess. Um, like whether or not you reset when you go to bus off or try to get back on the bus without resetting. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that nodes could behave. Um, within the bus, within the, would still be within the bus specification. Um, so you just have to do some some experimentation to see how how they'd respond. So the the, the plant question was: Is there a way we're going to be able to get Cant on a car um, without installing our own device? Um, so. Cant is fairly simple. Um, it's about uh, 1,500 lines of code in total, um, about half of which is just support initialization type stuff, so about 700 lines of interesting code. Uh, all you really need is be able to generate an interrupt on a GPIO input and have two timers, um, which is something that pretty much every microcontroller I've ever seen can do. So if you could get code execution on a microcontroller on an ECU, um, you could just do can't from there. Um, the, uh, if you look at the, the, the wiring diagram I have up for can't, um, you could actually multiplex a can peripheral to the GPIO lines that I'm using. Um, and you just do the same thing in reverse. So the, 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 if, the can line, if the lines that the CAN bus, 
that the CAN transceiver is connected to on the CCU can be multiplex to GPIO with these properties, then you could do it using an existing, GP, uh, an existing ECU as well. Uh, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Anything else? Um, well, TPMS usually goes back to the body control module, which on our demo is on two of the three CAN buses. So. Sorry, the question was uh, about TPMS attack vector. I tried to plug it into Mitch's car, but he wouldn't let me. <laughs> uh, most likely, yeah, the, the engine would probably shut down and stuff would stop working, possibly badly. Oh, and we're out of time. Like your all your messages for 